Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. Pledge allegiance to the Approval of minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from October 17th as submitted? I'll make a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. Um, as we discussed before, if you have anything um, that you want to uh, question or discuss about the CSC or CPSC, we need to take that into executive session because of the manner of it. But if there's no questions, do we have a motion to accept the report as submitted? I move it. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. We're up to public comment. Thank you, everyone, for coming. How many students do we have? Oh, wow. Okay. For government class? Some for, okay. So um, get your form signed at the end of the meeting. You're in it for the long haul. <laughs> um, the Board of Education welcomes and encourages, encourages input from the public at board meetings. Please note that neither the board nor the administration may engage in a dialogue or respond to questions concerning personnel or student matters. This is not an attempt to restrict public comment, but is done to protect the privacy of the individuals involved as required by law. As a matter of courtesy to others in attendance, comments of individuals or groups should be limited to less than three minutes. Does anybody have any public comment? Concerns? <laughs> I think the majority of everybody knows you, but if you could just state your name for the minutes. Yep, Betsy Drove, and I am an officer for the PTSA group that we have, and I just have minutes from our meeting that we just held. Um, we had our first um, parent community coffee on Thursday, November 2nd. The high school student council funded the function, and they had a great turnout. For, for the first meeting, they had six parents three staff members and a member of the Walton Police Department. And we have set up a cornhole slash volleyball tournament for Saturday, March 10th from five to nine here at the high school. We're gonna open it to parents, students, um, staff members, community members. We're gonna have a $10 per team entry fee with a free bag of popcorn. <laughs> We're hoping to have members of the yearbook committee there to take some pictures. Um, let's see, and Mr. Kanuski is gonna mention that in the December newsletter. And we're, we're gonna have prizes for first, second, and third places. We're thinking movie theater, Maltos, local restaurants. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. And then hopefully in January, we're gonna have some students um, open enrollment for the Leo Club starting in January. I think that's about. Yep, next parent call. Oh yes, the next parent coffee meeting is December 5th so at five o'clock. And I think we're gonna try to hold it in the library. December 5th? Yeah. Okay. Clock. Okay. And did you notice any concerns that the public has out there or staff? Tonight student? we didn't have any. I think I, I didn't go to the first coffee mm -hmm. one the other morning. There was some they brought some. They brought some excellent points, and we're actually acting on that now. We've already pointed out to the okay. parent safety, parents. Oh, that's the right. Yep, I'm sorry. Yep, I'm right. Right. There's yeah. a, okay. a workshop for parents and internet yep. safety. Okay. So we're going to put in there with that together. So we're working. We're working on. Um, do you remember? It was two or three years ago we had the internet safety presentation with the um, investigator from Homeland yes. Security. So we're yep. trying to. Um, connect with them again and bring the presentation here where they did it during the day and you requested an evening yep. presentation as well. Okay, good. Nice. Yeah. We're pretty excited. So, look for those to come out. 
and Betsy's also a new member of our community group. She serves on it with us. So and Graydon's on it and uh, Marilyn's on it. So yeah. Good. He's involved a lot. <laughs> All right, breaking me out of jail. Right. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank All right, you. well, thank you. you. Are there any other public comments? Okay. Um, does anybody have any discussion items? Nah, I would like to thank um, all the board members that at attended our training. That was an all-day event. Um, I thought it went well. And uh, we had a board goals training that was going to be coming up, but we're going to actually move that out, which I think Roger will touch on right. later. Um, but thank you to Corey for compiling all of our notes. How you made head heads or tails, I don't know, but thank you. We got all that. And um, okay, correspondence. Did you have? Did you want to touch base on the legislative breakfast? Uh, I do. It's yes. Is that in, I was going to put that. Fine. Okay. It, well, I can. That's fine. I can. It's the. Um, it's Saturday, December third. Corey. Second. 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 Uh, Nine thirty at uh, Suco. So if anybody's interested, email Corey. I cannot, I, unfortunately, that's my class weekend, so I won't be able to attend. But um, if you contact Corey, she can make the reservations for it. Okay, RSVPs are due this week. Okay, I'll probably be attending that. Anybody else wants to go along? Scott, go with Rhonda. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we are up to presentations. We have an independent audit report. Um, Chip, Chip Clark from Dark Angelo. Good evening. Good evening. Final copies of our report that I'll hand out to you. <laughs> Angelo and Company and the engagement partner on this audit. Um, what you have in front of you uh, is the June 30, 2017 uh, results of our audit. And uh, you have two items in front of you, really two packets in front of you. One is the extra classroom um, audit, and the other one is the basic financial statements of the district, the audit of, of the district financials. I'm going to go over both of them. Uh, I'll first go over the basic financial statements, which is the thicker packet that you have in front of you, and there should be two letters that are part of that. They're both required communication letters. Um, the first one is titled Required Communication with Board of Education. And this is a pretty standard letter relative to the performance of our audit. Were we able to perform our audit procedures effectively so we could opine on the financial statements? So that's basically what that letter is. And we were. We were able to do our audit procedures. We were able to issue an opinion on the financial statements. Um, so a pretty standard letter relative to the performance of the audit. It also outlines any significant estimates. And you'll see those in the uh, middle of the page. Uh, mainly some GASB requirements, GASB 45, um, which is um, post-employment benefits or your health insurance that's required to be accrued. Um, you'll see compensated absences, which is your sick and vacation balances that we, we, uh, we receive an <coughs> estimate on and we accrue. And then uh, depreciation on your full accrual financials and GASB 68, which is your old pet, um, benefits. Or your pension benefits, I'm sorry. Uh, so pretty standard letter. We, we are in compliance with all the GASBs on these financial statements. And I'll go over the opinion letter and I'll go over some of the, um, the, uh, the other uh, findings uh, relative to the audit in the next letter, which is uh, the letter titled Required Communication of Areas in Need of Improvement. And this letter is for any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies that we found as part of our audit procedures as well as any other best practices that we want to recommend um, to the district and there was um, if you if you move to page two 
you'll see there was a significant deficiency this year relative to closing procedures and the monitoring of the closing procedures. This basically, you know, is when we came out and did the audit, were all the accounts properly reconciled? They weren't when we came out. So uh, we're recommending here the district implement procedures to properly monitor the closing procedures that you at this district have the BOCES perform a lot of that. So we're looking for better procedures on the closing of the books. So when we come out, all funds and all accounts have been reconciled. Okay. Um, the other matter relative to segregation of duties, this is really a best practice. Um, so what we're looking for here is the documentation of, of review of certain exception reports that your financial system generates. Because of their segregation of duties in most small school districts, um, the financial um, system provides some mitigation of those, of, of those risks. So here we're looking for a vendor master exception report. This is if somebody were to add a vendor, change an address of a vendor, um, or remit to type of address, um, that would show up on this report. So we're looking for somebody to review the report, not just review it, but document that they reviewed it and maintain it for audit. So when we come in, a control hasn't been performed unless it's documented. You know, we can listen to, we can, you know, it might be being done, but unless it's documented and available for our review, we really can't rely on it. So in this case, we were told that it is being, that it was being done, but it was not maintained, signed off, and available for audit. So really, that's what we're looking for here. Just better documentation of any controls that are being performed. If you're gonna do it, document it so it can be audited. Uh, bank wire transfers. Here you have two banks that you need to deal with. One, you, you do receive a callback if a wire transfer has been made. The other one, you don't. And that's big with school districts now. There's been some issues with wire transfers. Um, uh, highly uh, publicized um, um, with problems. So here what we're looking for is you do business with banks that allow for this control to be put in place. So what it is is, is when a wire is made, a, another individual outside of the business office will receive a phone call that the wire has been made and they, and they authorize it. Okay, so just a secondary control uh, or monitoring of any bank wire trans or, uh, transactions that occur. Next page in, unassigned fund balance. Uh, real property tax law limits school district fund, uh, unassigned fund balance to 4% of the subsequent year's budget. Um, your fund balance is at 6.2% this year, so slightly over in my opinion. Not drastically over. Um, this is common with a lot of school districts. Sometimes they're over, sometimes they're a little under. You're over. Uh, all this really means is that you got to come up with a plan um, to utilize this fund balance through budgetary procedures in the future to try to maintain under the 4% limit. So not a, not a big deal required to be communicated in this letter because it is a compliance item. Um, but I'll give you my personal opinion, 6.2% is not an excessive amount to be over the 4% limit. Okay? Especially with some a lot of the uncertainties that happen with school district budgeting. Uh, the next page in is required status of prior year findings and recommendations. First here is user access to the, the financial software. Um, here what we're looking for is, again, a documented review of individuals' user access uh, within the financial software. And who has access to what and do they need access to what? So that's where your controls are going to lie is these, this type of segregation. Um, of duties and the documentation of that. Um, unassigned fund balance, you were slightly over last year. I think you were at 4.2%, so just 0.2% over the 4% limit last year. Um, so you're out of compliance last year uh, all, as well. Any questions on this letter? Just one. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the frequency of the bank wire transfers mm -hmm. that are out of compliance, is there just a relative? Is that a weekly thing? Is it monthly? Is it by quarterly? Well, a lot of it is, is payroll okay. type transfers. Um, so I would say it's probably <clears throat> at least uh, two a month um, and, and potentially more. They're not out of compliance. Right. 
It's just this is a best practice to to kind of strengthen the internal control. Yeah, I was just wondering what the <clears throat> what the scope was of the callback. You know, was it what the frequency? But you're talking, you know, 24 times in a year for that callback. Track. Potentially, you know, it could could be more depending on how wires are done. If there's you know shortages in an account where you do a wire, um, but mainly I think it's going to be payroll related type transfers. Okay. Ask you another question on that. Just <clears throat> is there a um, a norm of who that callback person goes to? There's not. And they like it to be um, out somebody outside of the business office. You know, obviously somebody who um, is really uh, doesn't work directly with that type of transaction. So if these are uh, payroll related transactions, um, then you want somebody out of the payroll department. Um, in this case, it might be Roger. That is that person, somebody who has the ultimate oversight over this. Uh, so if your business official is making these transfers or your treasurer is making these transfers, then um, somebody outside of that business office really should be the one receiving that phone call. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, I'll get right into the actual financial statements or your thicker bound financials. And uh, we had a conference call with the audit committee. Um, went over these financials in detail. I'm going to provide, you know, a summary here of, of, of this year's activity. Um, I'll move you to uh, page one and two. This is our opinion letter. And this is what's called an unmodified or clean opinion. Uh, it's the highest level of opinion we can provide on the reliability of the financials. So um, that's a good thing. We didn't have to qualify the opinion. We're able to, again, perform our audit procedures effectively uh, so we can provide financial statements that can be relied upon. So an unmodified clean opinion. Um, we're also uh, required because uh, with all school districts required to do an audit in accordance with government auditing standards. That basically requires us to gain an understanding of the internal control environment, test that internal control environment, and provide any information relative to any significant weaknesses or our significant deficiencies or material weaknesses, as I just discussed with you, um, the ones that we discussed. Uh, uh, we're also required, because you receive uh, federal monies in excess of $750,000, we're required to do a compliance audit in accordance with what they call uniform guidance for the Single Audit Act. Um, that requires us to uh, periodically test certain programs um, that are federally funded. This year it was the school lunch program that we tested. Uh, next year it might be the Title I grants or, or the special ed cluster. Um, it's on a rotation, rotation that is uh, that we follow the guidance on as to, as to what we select. Ends up being roughly 30 to 40 percent of the expenditures of federal monies that we end up testing. Um, but that was a, a clean letter relative to compliance in the um, in the federal awards. I'll next move you, um, I'll, I'll first note that pages 3 through 11 are what's called a management discussion and analysis. This is kind of what, you, what is an executive summary um, that it goes over mainly the government-wide financial statements. Um, I'm not going to go over this because I'm actually going to go through the actual financial statements themselves. But this is meant for um, you know, a person that doesn't want to, not going to understand some of the, the actual financial statements. And this gives them a summary of, of, of how the district ended up in its net position. I'll move you to page 12 to get right into the, the actual financials themselves. And this is the statement of net position. Now, this is the full accrual, which is required, a full accrual statement of net position. This is going to include all funds combined. It's going to include your long-term assets and long-term liabilities. So it's going to include your fixed assets, your building, net of uh, accumulated depreciation. It's going to include any long-term debt, such as serial bonds, and then any, any required GASBs um, that, that I'll, I'll go over. So this is your full accrual. And then we are also required, which I'll go over in a little bit, the actual fund financial statements, which is your general fund, your school lunch fund, your, your special aid fund, and whatnot. Uh, so this, uh, your, your full accrual financials, your total um, assets of 33 million. 73% of that was in capital capital assets net of accumulated depreciation. So the majority of that is right in your fixed assets, your buildings, your, your major equipment and whatnot. You'll see you had roughly 2.9 million in cash at the end of the year. And then uh, due from other governments, or that's state aid that was still due at the end of June of 1.3 million. 
liabilities, total liabilities, two thirds of the page down, you'll see uh, total liabilities of 24 million 343. Uh, 14.5 million of that is what's called an OPEB accrual. It's, re it's a GASB requirement uh, to accrue health insurance. It's an actuarially determined number. District provides us, they have an, actual, um, an actuarial study done every year that provides us with this information and we're required to book it. Um, so that was uh, roughly 60% of your total liabilities is that accrual. And that's gonna go up. I had this discussion with the audit committee, but if they're changing the GASB, that amount, because this is just a portion of the full accrual. Um, next year, we're gonna have to book the full accrual. Okay, so um, that number will, will get bigger next year. You'll see up above um, accrued liabilities of 678,550. That's an amount that is due to the health insurance consortium. Um, due to teachers retirement system and employee retirement systems um, of 809,543 and 68,859 respectively. Um, and a net pension liability proportionate share of 1 million. That is um, what we call it, GASB 77. It's, it's a relatively new GASB. It came into effect last year. Uh, but that is a required. We receive those numbers from the TRS and ERS systems who have um, audits done every year to comply. And, and, and we receive what's called a proportionate share, the district proportionate share of that liability. It's not a true liability of the district. It's really the TRS and ERS liability at New York State um, in the end, but part of the GASB is that the districts, the individual districts need to book it on their full accrual financial statements. Uh, total net position at the end of the year of 8,306,782. Um, you'll see just up, up above that, that unrestricted deficit of 9,454,225. That is solely due to the OPAB accrual. Because the OPEB accrual that I discussed, the 14,525, is an unfunded liability. There's no mechanism through New York State for the district to fund that. So these deficits that occur are normal for the government entities. Pretty much every school district we do in New York State has that because there is no way to fund it. So if you have a liability with no asset, you have a deficit. Page 13. And stop me if you have a question. Um, I'll, I'll answer at any time. Uh, statement of activities, total functional program expenses, again, full accrual of 23,515,800. Offset by, by program revenues, uh, charges for services of 198,137, which is charges in the school lunch fund for adult sales and those types of things. Um, operating grants and contributions of 1.3 million. That's going to be your federal grants, your state grants. Um, general revenues of 19,470,792. 6.5 million of that is your real property taxes and star. Uh, 12 point, roughly 12.6 million is your state and federal sources or your state aid and federal aid. Leaving you with a, a change in that position on the government wide of roughly 2.6 million. And again, that also, that deficit is also due to that OPAD accrual that we have to book. So we're booking an expense every year and there's no offsetting revenue um, for that. On page 14 is your balance sheet for your governmental funds. And so this is your general fund, school lunch fund, special aid fund, debt service and capital. Focus most of my, most of my attention right here on the, on the, the general fund. General fund had total assets of uh, 4,207,590. 2.3 million of that was in cash. Um, roughly 800,000 was due from other governments, uh, which is your, again, your, your state, your state aid. Um, due from other funds of, of roughly uh, 989,000. Um, total liabilities of 1,911,184. And total fund balance at the end of the year of 2,296,406. Now, of that, your unassigned fund balance was 1,266,516. Um, and again, that is 6.2% of your subsequent year's budget. Up above that is your assigned fund balance of 731,000. 
That's made up of seven, roughly 703,000 that you appropriated towards the subsequent year's budget, or the 17-18 budget, and 28,000 in encumbrances that are being rolled over um, to next year. School lunch fund has a fund balance of 40,000. Debt service fund has a fund balance of 96,450. And the capital fund has a slight deficit of 50,000, mainly due to short-term bond anticipation notes um, that occur once once long-term funding occurs on those um, that deficit will be eliminated page 15 is a reconciliation statement between again the full accrual and the fund statements pretty much what I explained to you the differences there the capital assets the long-term <coughs> debt and whatnot page 16 is the statement of revenues expenditures and changes in fund balance or your income statement Total revenues in the general fund of 19.5 million. 6.4 million of that is real property taxes and STAR. 12.5 million um, is in your state and federal aid. Um, slight deficit in the general fund of 282,109. School lunch fund, um, total revenues of 550,000. Total expenditures of 497. So you get surplus in the school lunch fund of 53,585, which is great. Uh, you can see a lot of that. That service fund again, total fund balance at the end of the year of 96,000. So just interest earned and in, in that service fund. Page 17 is another reconciliation statement uh, between the government wide and, the, and the, the fund financial statements. Page 18 and 19 are your fiduciary statements, would be your scholarships and your trust in the agency, uh, fiduciary accounts. Pages 20 through 44 are required note disclosures. I won't go through these, but these basically are, are, are um, disclosures of um, are some of our accounting standards that we're required to file, follow, as well as some statements that break out certain balances within, within the financial statements, you know, reserves, that type of thing. So if you haven't gone through those, those notes, you know, they're, they're informative. Uh, but I won't go through them just because, you know, I kind of uh, discuss the items as I go. But you'll see some of the required disclosures and uh, that, are, that are required due to the GASBs. The new GASBs that are out, GASB 68 and GASB 77, are the biggest ones. Some of those disclosures go on for two or three pages, so it's significant. I'll next move you to page 45. And this is a good good statement to see how you are a good schedule as to how you perform relative to your budget. You see total revenues um, above the other financing sources um, of 19,570,933. Actual revenues <coughs> came in at 19,504,897. So you're, and you'll see your variance there of roughly 66,000, very tight on the revenue side, which is what we see with most school districts um, as, as how they perform relative to the revenue. Um, on the expenditure side, down to very towards the very bottom. You'll see total expenditures budgeted, final budget of 20 million 194, 144, and actual expenditures 19 million 787, um, six, and uh, encumbrances of 28,000. Uh, leaving you with a variance um, on your performance on the expenditure side of 378,494, 1.8%, which is completely within a reasonable expectation as an auditor as to how this how this district performed relative to their budget. We do a lot of school districts, so you kind of have a, an idea of where you should be relative to the um, budget. And so this is within that reason, or within that uh, reasonableness. Um, next, we'll be to page 52. It's the required letter relative to the district's performance in accordance with government auditing standards. I kind of went through this already. Um, uh, you're required to uh, get an understanding of your internal controls, test your in internal controls, and document any significant <coughs> deficiencies or material weaknesses. And, and as I said, there was one relative to the closing procedures. Page 54, um, again, because you, re you received in excess of 750000 required to do an audit in accordance with uniform guidance. This is the required report relative to that. And this was a clean letter relative to the compliance on the uh, um, test of the school lunch fund. 
Chris Poulin's uh, federal monies that came in. You'll see the breakout of your federal monies on page 56. Total USDA of 374,867. Total uh, uh, Department of Ed of 699,126. Total federal awards um, of 1,073,993. That's all I have on the uh, basic financial statement. Any questions on that before I get into the extra classroom? Okay. The next packet that you have is, is the extra classroom. This is going to be pretty uh, pretty easy. Um, as as with the basic financial statements, um, there are uh, required communication letters. Um, there was uh, the required uh, communication with those charged with governance. We were able to opine on the financial statements, able to uh, perform the audit um, effectively. So a pretty standard letter relative to the initial uh, um, communication there on, on the governance. The next letter is required communications of areas in need of improvement. If there's any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies, we note those here. Um, as with all extra classroom funds, there's an inherent risk there. Um, just based on how they operate. You get students collecting monies, the cash the internal controls over cash receipts aren't gonna get to the level that the district has over its cash receipts, just based on how they function. You got ever-changing students coming in. Um, they're meant to be a training tool for students um, and they're just not gonna meet the, the, the same level that is required, which is a high level um, required for a, a school district to have what, what uh, an unmodified opinion. So we qualify our pending relative to the cash receipts at the point of collection. And we do for all, all school districts, just based on how they function. Uh, next, I'll get into the actual financial statements for the extra classroom fund. Page one and two is that opinion. As I said, this is what's called a qualified opinion relative to the cash receipt cycle. So not as clean as the unmodified but still just one notch under that. You know, the worst thing you can get is an adverse opinion. Um, so this is just a qualified opinion. It just means these financial statements are accurate. However, cash receipts have a weakness um, inherent with, with, with how they, they are collected. So you, just point you see other schools do anything different? Like, I mean, what you're talking about sales at sporting events, things like that, being able to, to um, match receipts on that. Are other districts doing different, or are they all getting about the same opinion? They're all, all of our school districts get the same opinion. Okay. It's not so much those, it's really <coughs> the fundraising activity that happens, the, the candy bar sales, the um, a lot of the cash that, that, that goes back and forth just based on how, how they, they raise their money. Okay. Um, is that based on the projections and stuff like that are not being done out? On it, or is it just because of receipts? I mean, how, what? Well, projections are our best practice to have to, to come up with an estimate of what the, of the funds, but it still doesn't mitigate that risk at the point of, of, of collection. So that is being done on some of them. And again, there's a lot of clubs, um, so I don't think they're all doing that, but you know, some of them do projections. So that is something that yeah, you want to see. Um, but still, even with that, it doesn't it doesn't mitigate the risk. Okay. You'll see on page three, cash of 64603 That includes all, all your clubs. Um, page four, total revenues of 139342 total expenses of 133578 um, And then on page six, you'll see a breakout of all your clubs and the cash balances for each individual club at the end of the year. Any questions on the extra classroom? Other okay. than, I mean, giving a receipt to everyone that buys a candy bar, that's kind of difficult to fall within those guidelines. Yeah. And, and, and these, a lot of these sales are happening. They're, they're not, there's no centralized mechanism for these fundraising activities. They're happening a lot of times off, off school district mm -hmm. premises, and you don't know, uh, really, you can't control. Candy bar sales are actually a little bit easier than some of the other fun fundraising activities that occur, so like car washes. And that type of thing. Right. Uh, depend, depends on the, on the club. 
Uh, but what we like to see, because again, these are a training tool. That's how they're, they're meant to be a training tool uh, for students. Um, so, you know, we look for um, education, you know, trainings for, for the, both the advisors and the, and the students, you know, annually. Right. You know, is, there, is, there, is there training going on? Because again, the, the really meant to be a training tool um, for students. Yeah. Nobody else had any questions? Well, thank you, Chip. That was thank very you. thorough. I oh, appreciate thank it. You. Yes. No thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Roger, I have a box there. Okay. Um, that I'm going to bring over over here. It's got a, a transmittal letter. Okay. Um, and then that's going to be some extra copies in there okay. for anybody. That Perfect. Needs it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're up to um, virtual reality with Rick Robinson and Crystal Trask, and hopefully they're going to shed some light on these blue things in front of us. Blue things. How's everybody doing? Okay, so my name is Crystal Trask, and I work for OCS, but I work with Wall as an instructional technology coordinator. I'm going to give you a little history of these VR sets that we have. When I first came to Wall, and VR was new, and I was really excited about it. I was like, we have to get VR. It's, it's going to be the leading thing in education. So excited about it. And I'm talking to Rick, and I'm talking to Dr. Reed. And they're like, yeah, I think it's going to be really great. What do we need? I was like, well, we just need some cardboard. We need cardboard, rubber bands, some, some magnets, these things. I'm going to tell you, this is a kit that we bought. Okay? It doesn't look fancy, but at the time, I made the original one out of a pizza box, okay? <laughs> so when we got these in, I was like, oh my goodness, this is it. I'm so excited for this. The only hiccup with this is that it would require the students to have their own device. And that meant the students would have to have the appropriate hardware because you have to have a gyroscope in your phone or device, as well as the appropriate software and storage space and students don't have a lot of storage filled up with selfies, okay? Um, so then when I found out that Best Buy paired up with Google to come out with this classroom set, I practically ran down to Rick's office and was like, we have to get these, it's going to be so great, and was begging him. Um, because this comes with a device, it comes with a viewfinder. It comes with a teacher tablet, a router. So all the teacher has to do is plug that in, have the content downloaded, have these turned on, which I'm going to have you guys do, show you how easy it is, and you're good to go on an adventure. Okay? They've already been used in the classroom. The third graders went to, not went, third graders observed Aurora Borealis um, a couple weeks ago. The eighth graders took, uh, Yes, so, seventh so graders, sorry. Yeah. The seventh graders took a trip to both the South and North Pole, okay, using the expedition as a culminating activity to their activity, um, to their unit. They will be traveling to Mount Everest as an anticipatory set. Uh, the art teacher will be using it as an arts and culture and taking some students in the high school to a museum and looking at various architecture across the world. So there's lots of opportunities. The teachers are very excited to use these. And they've been receiving PD. All of the staff was introduced to the VR sets, exactly what you're going to see um, the opening day. There's been ongoing PD. There's PD this Thursday for them as well. Okay. Did you bring your swimsuits and snorkels? <laughs> you didn't get the memo. <laughs> That's get the okay. Memo. <laughs> it's okay. And my life is over, right? <laughs> swimming. <laughs> So, uh, whatever you need, whatever you need, it's fine. So what I need you to do is open up your VR set. Okay. And up at the very top, you'll see this longer button with an up down, and then right next to it, there's a little small button. Just tap that small button, that's the power button, and it's going to wake your screen up, okay? And it'll, it should have a flag on it, and then down below, you'll see a flag that says Expeditions and Cardboard. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. What I would like you to do, I'm going to get my teacher tablet ready. And you will be 
be able to view over here. I have to restart. This is the first time we're casting it. And so what this is allowing is allowing the community members and staff and students to view what the teacher is seeing. So you can also pop out um, momentarily from your viewing experience to see what the teacher is seeing and how they can use that in the classroom. I have to restart this. So that's what's going on. Um, if you touch the expeditions, does anybody have content that says I accept or do we all see people going, yay, we're so excited. You have I accept? I accept. Go ahead and click I accept speed read and click that I accept. Yeah, I and then you should have the people looking excited to start an adventure, yeah? Yes. All right. Click on this one. I had a really difficult time picking what we were going to do today because there's so many different things. Okay, guys, I'm going to take you on a virtual field trip. That's, That's me. That's you. Is that you? Not me. Everybody here. Yeah, we can That's do right. Everett. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's okay. You probably just went to a tutorial. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Okay. It's not you're showing. Okay. Okay. And you're going to stay right there. What we have to do is wait for this one to load up. Yeah, but because I was casting it and it fell asleep, oh, okay. when I went to wake it up, it was flashing. So we just have to restart it. And it's, it takes a little bit. Um, has anybody experienced VR before, virtual reality? Heard of VR? Okay. I will warn you that, let me give you a couple warnings. You can use these with glasses. I have used them with my glasses before. That's fine. If you start experiencing motion sickness, okay, because it is right here in your face, it's okay. You can either pull it away. Nobody's making you do this. Mine's take a break. Shut down. Or you can open it up and on your screen, not right now, you won't see it, but there'll be the little full screen, like when you watch a video online, a little full screen. You touch that and it'll make it all one screen and then you can hold it and use it. Okay, so when I when we're ready, you're going to close these up and then you can look up, you can look down, all around, you're in swivel chairs. Have fun with those. Okay? You cannot move forward or back. I mean you can. It's not going to do anything in your viewing experience except for get you to run into things. Okay? Well, I gotta say these are my drone. Yeah. I put them on like you and then I'll fly the drone. That's that's a riot. Yeah. Okay. So we all are in the expeditions. Yes? Yes. 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 And it does it say follow yet? Yep. Yes. yes. All right, go ahead and start. click follow. And we are going to do an underwater excursion. You probably won't see anything yet. As long as you click follow, you'll see the cardboard. Close it up. Yep. You didn't accept it. Close it. Go ahead. Perfect. Close it. You're not going to see anything yet because on my teacher tablet. You're supposed to hit something else. Let me cast it over here. See what's going on. It's so warm. Any closing? Okay. So on my teacher tablet, I have a script that I can read with questions. There's specific areas that I can point you to and direct you to that you'll see. You're not going to see anything until I push start, okay? And I'm waiting because usually when I push start, we put it on and we go, oh my goodness, look at that, that's so cool. And nobody can hear me. Okay? <laughs> so let me explain. If you look over on the TV, do you see the little people in the number? That tells us how many devices are connected. So that's for the teachers to be aware of. So when they're teaching, they can see, oh, this dropped down to 10. I'm supposed to have 11 connected. Somebody's having an issue. I can address that and help them get connected again. Okay, so it's constantly monitoring. And one of the fun things is when I push start, I want you to go ahead, look around, have fun, but also pull away and then look at the screen because you'll see these smiley faces starting all around. And those smiley faces are the viewers and where everybody's looking. Okay? Are we ready? Yep. We are going to Saunders Reef, Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And I'm just going to read a little bit of, about it as you're doing this. Okay. You see on the screen right here? <laughs> and with the teacher, I can, this is what they're seeing. Okay. So, they can look all around and down 
and turn on your head. There's a fish right there, or a crab. Is that this fish? I see fish. All right. So it says, coral reefs are diverse ecosystems found in tropical water. Yes. They provide food and habitat for thousands of marine species. The reef also protects the mainland from strong waves created by storms. The Great Barrier Reef is one of the largest living structures on Earth. Visible from space, it provides a habitat for thousands of species of invertebrates, fish, reptiles, and mammals. Now, with my teacher tablet, you will see an arrow and then a circle. The arrow is directing you to a spot that I want to give you information about. This is about corals. And I can tell you now, corals are comprised of colonies and animals related to sea anemones. Their rock-like appearance comes from the calcium carbonate shell they secrete. Corals filter the water for nutrients provided by algae and other microscopic organisms. Okay, now I'm going to pause it, and you'll see pause. These are much quieter than the students. Usually when you hit pause in the classroom, you hear, oh, I paused it. Um, but by pausing, it allows the teacher to re-collect the attention, ask some questions, and process the information that they just Viewed. Okay, making those connections deeper. And I like the arrow too, because that, like, when you look away, it's like kind of redirecting you that arrow back to where you're supposed to be looking. That points to <laughs> what I like about being able to cast it is I'm only allowed to. I'm a teacher. I have a set number of spots that I could direct you to with the arrow, but if I have this displaying on the board, I can say, okay, everybody over here. You see what's what's going on down here? You see that fish? And I'm able to zoom in. And now I can have us all directed here, and we can start examining this and go rogue, per se, mm -hmm. off of this, okay? To build deeper connections. So we're just gonna go to a couple other ones. One of them I really like, which one is it? The Heron, Great, Heron Island Great Barrier Reef of Australia. And I like this one because you can see the turtle up close. Oh. Isn't it so <laughs> Okay. An interesting fact, we'll look at the turtle. Of the seven existing species of marine turtles, six can be found in the waters of the Great Barrier Reef. Green turtles are the most numerous. This herbivore can reach up to five feet long and weigh as much as 500 pounds. So this is a great way for teachers to continue talking about natural habitats. If they're discussing marine life, they can look at this up close. There's facts here that they can receive. There's questions that can be asked. And it also strikes their imagination, the student imagination. Um, in the third grade class, in Miss Day's class, the students have been so excited and they're saying, can we go here? Can we go there? Like I said, Thursday, I think I said Thursday, they're going to Paris. And, yeah, they're going to Paris. And we don't have to worry about mission slips, plane tickets, chaperones, anything like that. Okay? So it's very cool. Would you like to go anyplace else? I'm going to pause it. Do you want to go to Mount Everest? Do you have it? I have. I'm all. Yeah. <laughs> I don't ever hold it. Might as well see it. With your bionic knees? Come on. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The surgeon's with me. And it's a lot warmer here. Camp. Oh wow. Oh wow. That's cool. Okay, so this is space camp. Oh wow. <laughs> you gotta really turn around. There you go. Yeah, look up, look down. Really? So we'll look at the Kumbu Ice River. And this is interesting, the seventh grade teacher has a unit coming up that talks about Mount Everest and climbing Mount Everest, scaling it, and we're going to use this as an anticipatory set to give them an idea of what it was like. Because we have this idea, oh, Mount Everest, yeah, it's a really high mountain, it's cold, but when you look at this and you realize there is nothing else there. Nothing there, yeah. It gives you a different understanding and perspective of the information. 
Okay. So climbing Everest. Now all of these ones are static experiences. We do have the cardboard app, which allows you to have more virtual, immersive experiences as well, interactive. I love seeing the smiley faces. It's over here. It's amazing. Can you see them? Can you all look around? It's so fun. Okay, so that's everybody at the bottom. Yes. Yeah, that's where everybody's looking. Go kill valley and lakes. And this is the Gozumba Glacier. Which you can see how this glacier cut in half as it moved through the countryside just below the sixth highest mountain in the world. As temperatures warm, this and other glaciers so show signs of shrinking. So then you can have a talk about global warming and the impact of that. Okay? So helicopters. But you can zoom in. One of the questions is, would you ride a helicopter in the Himalayas? So you could ask your students this. <clears throat> why or why not? It's an A3. Okay. You flip around. And you can talk about what they're bringing in those jugs. Hypothesize on that, the importance of it. Let's see what else we have. Okay, last one for Everest is Edmund Hillary Suspension Bridge. Do we know what this is? You want information on it? Sure you do. Sir Edmund Hillary <laughs> was a New Zealand mountaineer who along with Sherpa Tenzing Norgay became the first documented climbers to summit Everest on May 29, 1953 during an expedition sponsored by the British government. Following this historic ascent, Hillary devoted most of his life to helping the Sherpas through an organization he founded called the Himalayan Trust. The Trust built many schools and hospitals for the people of Nepal. As you can see here, Hillary's Trust built bridges too. Would you guys dare cross that bridge? No. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Isn't that amazing, though? That is. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. Do you want to see the 3D? I'll share again. Yeah, it's just a fun talk. The last time I was on a suspension bridge was in the Oh, my goodness. So now, the people watching at home. Are they watching us, or are they seeing this as well? You want to see what they're saying? If they're, they're watching saying, us, I, I they're apologize. Seeing they're, they're, seeing, they're seeing this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid of that. They're seeing this. Well, I apologize. That's, <laughs> That's right. Well, are that is amazing. Questions? Now, how many do we have? Like, how many of these can go into the classroom? The kit? Yeah. The is kit comes with class? 20, and this is what it gets carted around in this heavy duty cart right here. It stores everything in here. So we have 20 VR headsets, which is about a classroom size. We ran into one incident where, you know, you had to buddy up. Okay. Just one or two kids had to buddy up. Um, I believe we are looking at purchasing one for each of the schools because they're being utilized in mm -hmm. this school. The, the two different schools are kind of in a tug of war of, well, I want that next, and I want to use it. Right. Yeah, that's amazing. That's really neat. That's one of my favorite things to share. So thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Anytime. Great. <laughs> Do you, I'll do it at the end. You're fine. Just close it, and it should be fine. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. About how the headsets transform. Yeah. 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 We'll bring okay. that in. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Mm. Move it as is. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Let me get. To, I gotta give my eyes a minute to adjust. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we are up to <coughs> new business. 9A, yes, except independent auditor's report. I'll move it. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. And we have 9B, the approved correction action plan. If everyone is. Motion approved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Okay, and now we are up to 9C, the curriculum instructor, consultant, and stipend. This is um, with Dr. Reed Levin. She has agreed to stay on and help us um, as a consultant to follow up the things and, and grants and grants we appreciate I that federal grants and focus all over second all in favor aye aye opposed motion carried okay um donations we have received so many donations um this month i, I find it amazing <clears throat> i just want to take a moment to read them and recognize um what we received 4000 from Stanley Black & Decker to the Rick Engelhart Memorial Scholarship. $161 from the United Presbyterian Church to the Townsend School for the Anti-Bullying Program. $25 from CNC Feeds to the Travel Club. $300 from Gearhart and, or Coughlin and Gearhart LLP to the Speech and Debate Forensic Club. $50 from Jeffrey Endress and Darlene Wollenberg to the Cody Endress Scholarship Fund. Uh, approximately 40 Animal Kingdom and Jack Cousteau encyclopedias from an anonymous donor to use as art projects or other classroom uses, which I think that's pretty neat. And $420 from the Michelle McNaught Memorial Fund to the middle school magical creatures drawing programs. I think that is amazing. So do we have a motion to accept the donations? I make a motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. <coughs> okay, um, 9E, we have the tax collector's report. And as I understand it, um, these were due to the state, or I'm sorry, the county. Mm -hmm. But we can anticipate a correct a revision right. to these. Okay. Um, We're still collecting. I guess deposits are still being made. Okay. By the county. Okay. So probably with the um, postmark date and everything, right. things were posted. And this had to be to the county by November 16th. Right. So do we have a motion to approve the tax collector's report? Move it. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, now we are up to um, our shared school business manager. Do you, you want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. So tonight in front of you, as you know, um, um, I'm putting a recommendation in that we share the business school business manager uh, with Downsdale, who's uh, Tim McGuire, has uh, 15 years of experience. I think we all know Tim. Um, um, his, um, children have gone through school. He still has a, a child in. Um, 11th grade, so he mm -hmm. lives in the community, very familiar with the, our school district. Um, I met with uh, Superintendent Evans and, um, and Mr. McGuire about a month ago to see if we could put something in place. They have agreed on it, so I'm hoping that you'll support the recommendation. Um, if so, uh, it will be starting effective immediately. So I think he'd be a great uh, school business manager, and I'm hoping that you'll support it. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Great. Thank so, you. Yep. That's nice to be able to get right be somebody here. right back into be the position. Tomorrow morning. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then we have
have um, 9G. Um, this was an emergency appointment and approval. Um, this is for the special education position. Right. So that position has been open since uh, July 1st. You know, we've had a hard time filling the position. Luckily, we have um, a staff member here um, that is certified that, um, in special education. Um, so she has ex accepted the position. So we're very lucky to have her. Do we have a motion? Mm -hmm. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Okay, and then we have personnel appointments. Um, this is going to cover a mentor. A mentor for the new teacher. For the new teacher, mm -hmm. yep. Um, and then we also have, um, it'll be necessary to appoint the new school business manager right. to the various roles. Right. And then, um, I think these are all lumped together, right? Yes. Uh, building level emergency response plans. Uh, the way I understand this, this is a need to have three individual mm -hmm. incident command teams rather than just two in the past. Correct. So, does anybody have any questions on that? Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Okay, and we. Um, are we holding off on the policies? No, we, we have two. two we have two. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to change. Yeah. The just let me know when you're Okay. Um, we'll be removing. I'm going to policy. <laughs> yep. We'll be removing policy. Um, 8505 on us lunch meals. Okay. But the other two policies will be looking to um, go ahead. Great. And if you look talk on the uh, executive session policy. Um, our executive session policy uh, that you guys received 9322. Um, it also cites a code of ethics policy, which is our policy 9010 that Paul's going to discuss in a second. <coughs> Excuse me. We have a couple changes to that. We wanted to uh, make an amendment for the first reading. Um, the first amendment would be where it says a board may not take action into executive session except for to vote on disciplinary charges against a tenured teacher mm -hmm. at these sessions unless otherwise provided by law. Okay. And we would like to add that um, because if the law does change in the future, we, re we really don't want to redo a policy just based on one sentence. Okay. So yep. it would include um, any kind of legal changes in the future moving forward. And also underneath that, we wanted to delete the individual board members' statement and add in for clarification that ties it back to the code of ethics. We'd like to insert the paragraph on confidential information. It reads a board member, officer, employee shall not disclose confidential information acquired by him or her in the course of his or her official duties or use such information to further his or her personal interest. This includes matters discussed in executive session. However, the board acting as a whole may decide to disclose such information where a disclosure is not prohibited under the law. So we'd like to add that uh, confidential piece and delete the individual board member acting on their own shall not disclose matters discussed in executive session. We felt that this would more um, capture the role of an executive session and if we invited um, staff and anyone else into the executive session, it would tie them back into our code of ethics policy. So we'd like to have those changes for our first reading, and then Paul's going to elaborate on our code of ethics. All right, policy 9010, again, code of ethics. It was referenced in the other one. Um, no material changes. There was only one small uh, formatting change, and that was to uh, put the numeral two ahead of confidential information that was omitted. So it went from one to three without the number two. But other than that, um, we like the policy as written. So. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. Can Mr. Dutcher share his notes with me? <laughs> sure. Thank you. Why do I talk fast? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if we have a motion um, to approve these as the first reading as amended, policy only policy 9010 and 9322. We have a motion. I'll make a motion. Second. 
Second. Can it come out of the committee? Yes. Okay, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, carried. All right, we are up to administrative remarks. Director of Curriculum. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, um, I want to thank all of you um, for the opportunity to provide to Mayor Carlton, uh, new member, board members as well. Um, the faculty here have been amazing to me. Um, I'm not going to get too emotional. I was worried about this. <laughs> um, but really to thank you and I appreciate um, the work you've done here as well. And I will continue to do to make sure our grants are where they're supposed to be. Um, we do have quarterly reports that I do need to maintain up through February and those will be done as they're supposed to be. Um, and uh, concerning the focus grant, it was officially approved. So that money is over $122,000 to be used for professional development for our teachers, for our summer workshops that will continue. And if you have your new director of curriculum, make sure they're um, in line with that. And also it helps to pay for our um, SRIs, which is our reading assessment that we do for grades five now, all the way up through the high school quarterly so that we get um, you know, kind of gauge where students are in terms of our literacy, and so we have some internal benchmarking that we're using, so it will fund that as well, and other uh, professional development opportunities um, for our staff. So it was nice to get the final approval for that, so that money, again, will help to support that throughout the year, not just in the summer, so teachers have many opportunities to do that, so I was really happy that that came through. And of course, I had to do a final newsletter <laughs> for the district. It includes a lot of photos and some teacher highlights and upcoming professional development and working with um, technology departments. Of course, has been a wonderful help in providing uh, PD and technology some of the things that you're looking at tonight and trying to encourage more teachers to take advantage of that so they can be paid for that mm -hmm. uh, through a grant. So, final newsletter edition oh. for you high off the presses today <laughs> so, <laughs> to get that out. And there should be a copy for each of you and one thank for you, you as well, Mr. Clark, which is the file as well. So again, thank you so much. And again, you'll be hearing from me, maybe not seeing me physically here at meetings. But again, thank you all so very much. I appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Thank we you. appreciate everything that you have done, the hard work that you have put into our district, and the dedication that you have put into our district. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Take some water, guys. <laughs> you know, I just want to echo, um, I, so this is my fifth year as, a, as your superintendent, and when I was being interviewed, and Butch and Rhonda, you remember this, they asked me, they asked me about the middle school principal and the curriculum person, and which one, you know, which one would you go forth with, and I said, you really need the curriculum person in order to get our house in order, um, and it was, if you remember the budget, was passed by one vote. We were lucky enough to interview Michelle and um, hired her. And I will tell you, she came in with it was sort of a blank slate, uh, and she worked very hard. Uh, we, and we met several times. Our admin team met several times, um, and that's happened for three years straight. You know, uh, Michelle and I have met several times during the day. Our administrative team. She's been a big piece of this. Um, but you know, I always say when you leave a position, you try to leave it in a better place than what it was. And we're definitely in a great shape uh, mm -hmm. because of the work that you know, that she's done so you know I appreciate the board supporting that position because it's a very very important position and without that position um, the you know the strides that we've made in the last five years probably wouldn't happen so um, she's done a great job I told her she's off to uh, back to her home school I think she, there I talked to her superintendent her new boss which was her old boss um, but they're very excited <laughs> about having her there and she's gonna be a huge asset at, at her new district so well, Michelle, for me, and I know the admin team, thank you so much. We're going to miss you. But I'll be seeing you anyways for the next three months. So we already have meetings set up yeah. so we can discuss <laughs> those. <laughs> so it isn't my last goodbye to her. But, but I just wanted the board to know we appreciate it in the public. So. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, 12B, Superintendent Remarks. So um, I wanted just to start, and I appreciate you um, including the administrative team into your board goals. Uh, we've met several times on your goals. Uh, we just met on Monday, and we spent a lot of time talking about board goals um, with Kyle. Um, I think uh, the administrative team came up with a lot of unique things. Uh, Kyle was very, very impressed and surprised with some of the um, items that the administrative team put forth. Uh, so that's why we've asked for a delay. And plus, Kyle, with all that information, he's not going to be able to get it back to us anyways. But um, your administrative team did a great job on Monday 
um, putting forth that to help help you look through those goals. So I think it's going to it's going to give us a clear picture. And we set we've actually set um, you know months and dates and years so that you can actually see you know what we envision and where we want to go with it. So once those are all out, we'll bring those back to you. So. Uh, the next thing I, I wanted to talk to you about was Broome Community College. I, I brought the idea of um, <clears throat> the college, bringing our students to the college last year. Um, we're gonna continue to um, have a great partnership with Broome Community College. We have, we've had a lot of college courses. Uh, the sophomore class will be taking a trip to Broome Community College like they did last year to visit the, the campus, to have lunch there, to talk to professors and students. And if anything, that's a great thing anyway, is that we can get kids to, to actually see the college campus. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring to your attention was uh, Dell High. Right now, uh, a student that goes there pays $160 for three credits. That will end starting in January. And it isn't because of Dell High, it's because of a, um, the higher education law that they can't allow any, they gotta charge the same tuition as they would for any student. So their cost is going up to $1,100. Um, which is going to be quite a bit uh, of money that they'll um, have to pay. Um, so some of the things with Dell High is they don't guarantee the class. So if a student wants to get into a specific class, they can't do that. Um, and it's it's going to you know the, the cost of that will be maybe prohibited on some of the students. Right now we have three students that are going to Dell High. Um, so one of the things that I don't, I don't I'm just putting this out there so you can think about it is um, looking at that Broom program once again. For a student to take a three credit course there, it's $550, which is, uh, which is a lot cheaper than Dell High. They're guaranteed a seat in the class, whatever class that they want to get into. Um, so it's just an idea that I just want you to start thinking about and seeing, you know, um, whether it's tr a transportation um, cost that we can transport them there, or, um, you know, we talked about last year about the paying the, the tuition costs, but those are just some of the ideas that I'll bring back to you during budget time. Um, and I've uh, talked to Mr. Kanuski about it, the guidance counselors, and we're having many conversations about it. And Broom is always very open and welcome. And I think you've talked to Katie Bucci uh, many times. Yes, about it. Times. So that's just, I'm just putting that out there right now for a conversation later uh, when we get into budget talks. So I'll keep you updated on that. So maybe that's something in the budget talks that we can discuss, not just not getting um, or ending the relationship with Del High, right. but keeping Del High yes. and yeah. also so, picking up right. ICC. So I wanted to put that both on the table and you knew the cost and everything in it. So, so what are the impacts of the three students and going to Del High now? When is that, when's that gonna end? In, uh, January 1st is when the cost goes out. So what's that gonna impact the three that we have going? Almost 600. Yeah. Almost, almost right. 600. No, it's gonna be, so yeah, it's gonna be more, it's gonna be uh, like a thousand, thousand bucks, $980. It's gonna be close to a thousand. Yeah. So, and okay. we already have them. Those students are already enrolled there and currently taking classes there. They are. So, Correct. what are their options if they can't afford to do that? I, I, I don't think any of them have said that they're not going to. Right? No. I think uh, they're going to the, continue. Their options are to try and pick up any college credit courses that we get to offer here. And fast forward. Um, but it's, again, it's not the same experience as mm -hmm. it would be right. just going to a campus. So they might. Um, so they're looking at the fast forward programs through run through Broome Community College, which are free. These are free classes that we offer here um, with our partnership with Broom. So they're looking at maybe taking the courses here, which wouldn't cost them anything. Um, but it is a difference. <coughs> the experience would be different because they wouldn't be able to go on the campus. You know, they'd be taking them here at, at uh, Walton. Are the three students seniors? I believe, no, I think they are all three seniors, yes. So you're, they have one semester worth of? Right. And we have next semester, we have three students again, two of the same. One is not, and then we have one that is picking up. I believe so. I think we're at three again. So they they were in. The, they actually told us that the increase was going up, and then we had to call the college and say what's going on, and yeah, until it came from um, from higher ed. And they've so. been they've been not following the guidelines. I guess for years right. trying to benefit kids. Now they're in a position where they're forced to to follow those guidelines. So what's Plan B for the students that are enrolled and the ones that are upcoming? If they're on that advanced pace, what are we going to do? And that's the thing. Uh, we, I already sat down there with Mr. Preston, uh, Ms. Gilbertson, and we based their schedule for the entire year because we scheduled yep. the whole year and we're semestered like they are. We've got to go go to Plan B and look at some of the courses that they can, they can pick up here. We do have options here. That's not saying we don't. We have okay. fast forward right. courses. We have ingenuity. 
where kids can do self-paced even college credit courses. And I know one of the students that um, they're going to go anyway, regardless of the costs they're going. Okay. So. I just want to make sure that we're being fair across the boards. That's all. You know, if they started on a fast forward program and then all of a sudden it was the foundation from falls off right. more underneath it, that's not, you know. Well, we, and we personally call um, yeah. Delhi yeah. ourselves. I'm sure. I'm and they're, and they're, uh, they said so they were working on some kind of, they were meeting that day. Right. Trying to do something. So they're still like, working on trying to yeah. lower the cost. But I don't, we, we looked at the regs and everything. It's still, it's there. I don't know how, unless they give like a, a tuition mm -hmm. or a scholarship of some sort. Which maybe that's that's the road that they're going down. So, so I have a question for you: How is Broom able to do it? Because Broom is a community college. It's not a it's not yeah, a SUNY. SUNY, so they have different rules and regulations. <coughs> okay. That's why they're allowed to. And I had you know when we had talked before, I had said you know maybe there's grants out there, something that you know especially with the kids that are seniors, you know let them follow through with it. Right. And if we just had a little more lead time. They didn't really get yeah. information out until like the end of October right. uh, for the, the next semester. In the world of academia, that's that's not much time. You're talking about. Right. And it's affecting. It's not just here. I mean, it's affecting all the ever all the high schools in New York State that go to um, two year school. Or Potential school. juniors that would be going in next year. So I mean, they're we're just going to make sure we're real, you guys are going to make sure you're really clear on our options that are on the table Absolutely. after the next budget cycle. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why I wanted to bring this. Yeah, I just want to make sure right now. Plan. Plan. I just want to make sure there's a very right. clear plan B as to how how it can be go forward. Right. That's all. Yep. All right, any questions on that? So I'll keep we'll keep you updated on it. Keep you posted. Um, I just wanted to remind you, and I, I know I've told you this in my my newsletters about the parent teacher conferences start this Friday, um, and then when we return after uh, Thanksgiving break, it's that Monday for the whole district, and then that December first is for elementary school. <laughs> And just a reminder, because we've had parents call about why we're not doing those evening events, and uh, we can <coughs> explain to them that we can't do the half days anymore, that we have to do the 180 days. You can't do half days before a holiday. You, you've heard me say this before, but um, unfortunately, that's something that um, that happened because of state ed, and I think our governor was involved in it. But um, And you also saw, I gave you information. I did um, put information to the 180-day calendar committee at SED about our concerns specifically in uh, rural school district and some of the administrators also gave me some information <laughs> that I submitted to the committee. They're supposed to come out with some uh, new results in December, some recommendations, so hopefully that'll change. So, uh, The last thing I just wanted to talk to you about was the, um, the tree lighting, the Christmas tree lighting. So we have um, the high school yearbook committee, the high school yearbook group, the high school student council, the middle school council, FFA and FBLA um, all donated. They bought tree, uh, lights and a big star uh, and the electrical to light the tree. Um, we decided that we're going to do the tree here um, at the district. Um, it'll be over by the pavilion. There were some concerns with the town and the tree being where, where it's going to be. Uh, so actually, we met. We have a great plan. We met with the, 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 the uh, groups and uh, we're going to make it a really a big festival night. Uh, we're going to kick it off after the um, Townsend Holiday Concert, Christmas Concert. Uh, and we're going to have uh, cookies at home, home and career is going to make, hot chocolate. We're going to have some dress up uh, Charles Dickinson carols. And uh, uh, Mr. Kanuski said he's going to dress up with a big top hat and Man. gloves. Um, we've got other, other surprises that are going to happen, but it won't be the same night as the parade. So we, so when are you with <clears throat> putting a base in to put the tree down into or we're gonna yes that that was what we originally planned to do and i think that was one of the concerns um that the town had was the size of the tree and to secure it safely so right as you know that same concern coming here how are we going to make sure that that's secured because this is a, a 30 foot no it'll probably it's it'll probably once we um once you trim it, once you, so I'm not a tree expert. Neither am I. That's why. I'm, <laughs> are you going to get out your pruning? And maybe butch no, man. Yeah. So there, the plan is, in case we have the conversation, is to have the hole, and then we're going to cement it. <clears throat> what we're talking about doing, uh, Niles has got a 12-inch iron pipe that's five foot long, putting a plate, uh, plate on the bottom, <clears throat> and then you dig it, set it down in, pour concrete around it. Now, how many yards it's going to take, I don't know. But like say <clears throat> that 
it'd be nice. It would have been better if we could have done it earlier so I had time to settle around, but now we don't. So that's why you're better off to just, when you dig it, get rid of the dirt, fill it right full of concrete. <clears throat> then that sh that'll set up. Okay. And you might still want to put a couple uh, cables from the tree down to the ground just to support it. Right. I mean, they're, what they're talking about doing the last I heard, what John was saying, is taking <clears throat> all the branches off so that when you set the tree down in, it goes all the way down into the pipe. Right. And then put braces or, you know, blocks on the inside to, <clears throat> if, you know, say if it's only a 10-inch tree and you've got a 12-inch hole, you have to put some wedges or stuff down to hold it and try to support it as much as we can. And then <clears throat> when they pull it out, you know, at the, after Christmas is done or after the holidays, putting a plate over top and have that bolted down so kids don't throw rocks right. down in it and fill that it was up. A plank, right? So, or that's what we were talking about for down there, and I didn't know if we were doing the same up here or what. So this the is other, a... the other option, well, for this year there wouldn't be, but like I say, it'd be better, almost better to have one of these outfits come in that push down in and pick the whole ball up and come over and plant it. And, That's what right. <clears throat> well, it'd be nice to do that, but you've got to do that during the summer or spring or summer so that it gets time enough so to grow in. It. Right. Right. And that's what, like after, you know, hearing the town conversation, then coming here, obviously a root bound tree would be much more secure, safer, um, more permanent type of thing. But, you know, you said you checked with the insurance company yes. and so we're covered on that we're covered for volunteers um who wanted to assist uh, like that's why we checked on butch so we're covered on that now um, from um, a logis just from a logistic standpoint there's a, i mean from an engineering standpoint i think what a great lesson you could work with the kids to say what are all the engineering forces involved in actually setting a tree and holding it up one of the concerns I would have is a racking load on it. We design stuff for wind load speeds. Like when a, when a wind actually hits it, you realize that's like four tons of tree in the air. When you hit it with a wind load, the rat, that actual load is what keeps it from toppling over. So it, it probably would be a great project to do diligence and say what those forces are to make sure that you are you have something in the ground stable. Um, I, just, I just would hate to sit here and say, you had the availability to do engineering on this. It's a public entity have people in, in the community involved they're going to be exposed to it god forbid you have a wind burst and nobody did the engineering behind it i, I just that's the only that's the only part from my engineering side of things where i look at things differently probably but mm -hmm. that's my only concern i would have on that i think it's a great public outreach i think it's a great community thing the fact that the students are lighting the tree and they're calculating all that stuff that's great how are you going to put the lights on the trees another logistical challenge because you're going to have to have lifts. Are they subject to OSHA? Do the people have to be certified to be in the lifts? Can you have the kids in the lifts? It's just a lot of, a lot so of questions. Yeah. Right. So the lift's going to come from, uh, John's got that. He's going to borrow it from the fairgrounds. They're going to put the lights up. We're covered with that insurance-wise as well. Okay. It's one of our employees that will be doing that. Okay. Now, the so the lights are actually done by adults? Yeah, the kids point. aren't doing No, it's going to be, no. It'll be John, and we have a couple of our workers that are going to volunteer okay. to do it. Like I say, if somebody's <clears throat> thinking that, you know, he put a five-foot pipe in the ground and, as you say, depending on just how tall the tree is, it does have a, you know, tendency that if the wind comes along pushing it, <clears throat> you could put some cables into it, which is going to restrict it a little bit. Is it going to be the best way? We don't know. But like I say, put a few cables or put three or four cables around it, plus being down on the ground, it'd be different if you, as they say, if you had the thing put in you know a month ago or so so the ground had a chance to start hardening back up it's awful late in the year to you know to get it even button concrete around it it's just still a guessing game well that's is the conky con conky yeah that's con <laughs> gonna cure yes wouldn't that that at this temperature <clears throat> well i think it's freezing but as long as it doesn't get no, you it's can not put, real cold that night you can put the additive in it if you know and cover it so you take it in. I just, is this, I guess my thing is location for using concrete needs to be a permanent location because that's a pretty big block of concrete to dig back out. Well, I mean, but do we even know? The, the challenge I have is you're, you're asking for something that you, you don't know, you don't know what those loading forces are. 
right? Unless somebody calculates and puts their name on it with a stamp, we don't even know what we're discussing. Is it five yards of concrete? Is it 100 yards of concrete to keep it from overturning? What's it designed for? If you if you decorate an existing tree and it blows over in the same fashion, it's an act of God. If you put the tree up and it blows over, it's no longer an act of it's God. It's a liability. Right so, and I hate to think like that because I think it's such a great, wonderful thing, but I, I would like it if somebody could actually say, here's the forces you have to overcome so you can answer that. And then you can say, we have a permanent setup from here to whenever, and this setup is got approval on it based on these engineering forces, it's acceptable and somebody has signed off on that. I, I really think that that's you doing your diligence. Um, I'm only one opinion, but um, let me. you know some engineers, I think. I might be able to check on that too. The other thought that I'm having, which is I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying and agreeing with that, would be instead of digging it by bucket, and I'm, would be to drill it because okay. if you auger it. The only trouble with augering it with the I think that you've got quite a lot of gravel. It's going to be hard to keep it cleaned out enough to put your thing back down in. And I'm not saying you have to go concrete. Like say, if if you, if you were doing it during the summer, augering it down, put the pipe in, and you know pack the stuff down and give it time, you know, water it and all this and that, and get it to settle in. You can do it without doing the concrete. But you know, at this late time, you all. Know, that's why on the bottom of it, there, you know. Like say, I've got a plate that's 30 inches by, I think, five foot. You weld, put the pipe in the middle of that <clears throat> and weld it to it. And the only thing you'd want to do is put a hole in the center so that if any water does get in there, it has a way out. And then when you put at least uh, the, there's a four yard minimum pour. You're going to pay for four yards, whether you take one yard or right. four yards. So that's why I figured, you know, you almost got to figure out uh, you know, can you use four yards or can you get away with two yards? And you, like a Christmas tree, you know your Christmas tree bases look like with the sidebars out? They're out there for a reason, for stability. So other, other options you could have is actually I-beams in a cross pattern with that same plate fastened to it to overcome those racking loads. I think it's a great teaching opportunity for kids. I know we're on a crush deadline for this thing, but if you could actually teach the, the physics behind that and say, here's what you have to overcome to a long-term project, and we get somebody to sign off on it, I think everybody's got a comfort level to move mm -hmm. forward with it, at least. And your date was December? December 6th. 6th? Yeah. And it's not, this isn't like a 100-foot tree. This is, it's, it's going to be like a 20, it'll probably be like 20 feet. That's what the tree will be. Mm -hmm. Okay. 20 that's feet's a lot different. better than Second before he was yeah. talking 35 right. to 40 feet. Yeah. And, that, it's not, and that's half and that's, a Rockefeller Center, and not which only, is why I was going. Right. And not only that, you also have the problem of in the branches, so you got to have straps that you carefully let it down, and then you've got to pick it up and you know put it on some type of a trailer. That's why nobody has really come out. You know, He just said that Tracy's got one up there. Tracy Kellogg's got a tree up there they could get. Mm -hmm. And like say, what, de what height they're playing with. But we still don't know if the tree is going to come back in a, as a whole tree or it's going to be missing half the side well, from laying it, it down. Like That's say, just care. you've got to just have some straps to, you know, I mean, you can still pick it up with a log picker or something if they've got somebody lined. I don't know what John's lined up. But it, a 20 foot tree is a different risk level to me than a 30 or 40 footer. Well, it, yeah, you know I don't I mean, I just. Right, we, 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 Cause I think the word Rockefeller tree came out. So everybody yeah. was thinking it's gonna be yeah. a 60 foot well, tree. Well, I said Rockefeller cause it's 75 foot. Yeah, and if right, we're talking 30, right. 35 so, feet. That's still so the tree itself, I mean, when we went out, I would say the t it was maybe 30 feet. And by the time they trim it and cut it and get it, it's gonna be probably approximately 20. I'm thinking like 20 feet once we bury it. And, and you're talking 12 inch pipes, right? What he's got? He's got a 12, 12 inch steel. steel pipe. So by the time you take a 12 inch base on a spruce or something like that, you Well, he's, according to what John was saying, the base of it was not, you know, it was smaller than the 12 yeah. inch. Mm -hmm. But like I say, if you go a 12 inch pipe, that should give you for next year or the year down the right. road, you know, down the road, gives you a little bit of flexibility. I mean, is the one he's, you know, that they've picked out, I haven't seen it. Is it 10 inches, is it eight inches? Too many unknowns. I mean, I didn't go, Roger, you, no. did you look at it? I mean, yeah, it wasn't, it's, it's not, yeah, the, I would say the base is like that. It's not, right, a, it's but, not like. <laughs> and then also as you, you cut off the bottom branches, you, you know, 
you yeah, draw the farther up you go, you're getting smaller. I mean, worst case scenario, if it's a little bit big on the bottom, you have to take a saw and trim it down. So I guess the question is, and I understand what you're saying, Braden, um, and I think that was the town's concern about it at Veterans Plaza. Um, how much comfort level do we have saying yes to the, this tree being placed as a temporary structure versus a waiting until a root bound tree can be planted, you know, root into the ground, be a safe structure, and then go from there? I think like one of the things we could do with this tree is set the tree and then kind of see and believe it. Set the tree and while you, like you say, you're going to have to use a strap of some sort so you don't destroy the tree to set it. It means you're going to be hooked onto the top of it or very reasonable to it. You could put some load against it with the hydraulics that you're picking it with and that will give you some indication on just what it is. Yeah. But then you, you cut a 30 foot tree, you transported it down, you got a, lot, a decent amount of time into it. Plus, uh, you know, I don't know. What, the, what are you going to set it with? Like I said, they're, if they're probably going to have to use a log picker yeah. with straps. Yeah, but like I say, the do they? I mean, when they move the Rockefeller tree, they you know they usually have two or three cranes already yeah, lined yeah. up. No. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just my my personal opinion from this standpoint, just as because we're a public entity, I just want to make sure we're doing our diligence. That's all I care about. I love the spirit of it. I think it's a great community activity. But if we don't do our diligence, what are we sitting here for? You know, it's an activity. I think it's it's numbers. It can be done in a couple hours. So is there is there someone that we can contact that would have that ability to do that? And if so, what made a potential fee be? Maybe we can get somebody to donate this listening at home. I don't know. Let me ask. Do you know work? I don't between, know. between Kevin and I, there's a few engineers. We've got a few people that are fees. But I think it'd be a great teaching opportunity for the kids too to say, you know, this is what this is designed for. Calling up. <clears throat> right, you would think a simple tree. <laughs> you know, well, like I say, but you could it, it, there's a huge liability attached irons, to that. Channel mm -hmm. irons. You know, there's different options. I sure. mean, with this, the putting the plate down, we just thought that if you put a plate down and it's flat, laying on the ground, you put concrete on top. In order to tip, it's got to. You know, it's got to tip a lot. And like I say, you know, it's a guessing game on how many yards of concrete you're going to get. Well, and that's a factor of what the loads are on it. So I think if we if we did that, I'd definitely be in favor of it. It's just I, a matter of doing that homework. We've got My gut tells me that you're playing with a plate and the concrete would not be an issue um, because of the fact, more than think with us for rail, for example, or guide rail, we bury basically it's a three foot cube and eight bolts on the top of it and when somebody hits that rail it doesn't pull that out of the ground i mean and the actual rail stretches it doesn't so that is something that is the top of it is at the ground i mean so if you pour four yards of concrete you are pouring several thousand pounds and like that, say and it was you just pull it up out of the earth which is a force in itself i mean so and like I, I think say, you would be how many yards? It's just it's still a guessing game. I mean, until you need to get it dug open and see, you know, and this is how much three. it caves in and how much right. this and that. You know, I mean, a three by five plate basically, right? There's a, I got a thirty inch by five foot plate, but like I say, if that's not big enough, we go something no, different. I'm just saying, thirty inch by five foot. So if you set that, you want to go five feet in the ground. Mm -hmm. You've got to be in perfect soil to dig vertically. So you're already talking a four by six. I mean, so you're probably actually talking on the surface closer to an eight by eight hole if you have very good ground and it stays stable. An so you, eight by eight? Yes, to put a plate like that five feet in the ground. Yes. So I mean, you are talking a substantial load of concrete going around that thing once you actually. And then, then 25.1 yards of concrete for that hole if you did it just for your concrete. Now that's gonna overcome all the forces the tree's gonna to put together, but who's gonna buy 25 yards of concrete? So there's a there's a give and take in that whole formula. And I'm just saying that if we just did that, then we can answer Butch, which is how much concrete goes in this thing based on weight, because you're using a ballast to overcome those forces of racking. You need this many yards minimum. That's, I mean, it's, it's simple math. It's just somebody's gotta do it and say, yes, this is the answer. Okay, so there's two, two weeks before um, the concert with Thanksgiving in there. 
is that something that either one of you think that you can contact a person to see what their thoughts are? Let's just we can have an answer by Friday. Friday. We'll look to have an answer tomorrow afternoon. And also, you got to look at with Thanksgiving coming up. Not everybody's going to be around. I'm just, right. And I know time is. So I'll get on the phone tomorrow so, morning when I get to work. I mean, I've got no problem with bringing it back up and dig the hole, but like I say, we may have to dig it and put a fence around it and leave it open until we can, you know, get more of an idea how, you aren't going to know how big the hole is actually going to be. Down on the bottom, yes, all right, you need a 30 inch by five foot. That's not a problem. But to get down there and get that, how wide are you going to go? <clears throat> so if, if we're, but isn't the idea, I know we have two solutions here one being a tree in a you know in basically a stand that goes in annually the other being more of a permanent solution where we bury a root ball well the tree with a, a root bound tree right. and have it stand the test of time if we pour all that concrete and everything aren't we committing to going to cutting a tree annually and putting it in and based on the first year's experience you may never want to do it again Depending on how it works out. I mean, it <laughs> well, the other thing is too, though, is to check that. And the, like I said, when I talk about it, think about it, the more numbers start to calculate in the head of just what this is, you may get away with that with the material instead of it being concrete. Your bag fill and compact with like a crusher on or something like that, you can make that stuff very hard and very sustainable and that's something that could be dug back out and used elsewhere or top so put back over it and you seed it and it becomes lawn and you plant a permanent tree and if you i'm just my other foot to this is the students have already gotten yeah. there there is an expectation there and yes. i don't want to be cutting them off at the knees once we've started this out i don't want to break the bank chasing us out but i think we've got something on emotion to do our due diligence and keeping it right. under motion, but kind of keeping a, a, a. And I agree with that, but um, the <clears throat> lights that you have, you said are commercial brand. Yes, they order so commercial brand, and you have a huge, you have a big star. Everything's commercial. I mean, they're LED, they're, so they would they would last for years and years, years and years and years, right? So we really want to. Too bad we didn't have more time to think this out because you really want to know is is that a permanent spot or down front a permanent spot where may a permanent spot be so at the the concert times that that can be celebrated um <clears throat> is there a chance that a smaller tree could be temporarily used this year well the to move forward you know with the students and everything and you know the the plan but until a, a decided spot is located because I'm thinking that's a lot of concrete well, to go in I mean, an area. To, that's just the numbers on that. You don't have to use that. Well, you, you just got to figure out what the forces you have to overcome as your temporary solution of setting a tree there, maybe for the first five years, but come up with a permanent solution for where you want to plant one so that in five years you can fade out of that process right. and jump into the other one. If those materials are already bought, I mean, it, there's been decisions made prior to even coming to this table where they already have all this in motion. They already have all the materials and stuff. How do you how do you say no to that? You know what I mean. So just let's do our diligence and make sure that we have alternatives moving forward. One of them, if an alternative is long term, tree grows. You need five years to get that growth. Ten years, then we know this alternative's got to be in place for five or ten years. Mm -hmm. But I, I just as long as you have the numbers that prove out and you can do it, most do it. So if it's agreeable with the board, why don't we change things tomorrow? Okay. Yeah, and then we'll be in touch with everybody on Friday. Hopefully for, tomorrow. Okay. I just I want to leave a little. But just get in touch with me well, so I can talk to the kids. So and I, you know, no. I just, I, I'll just, and I understand everybody's sincere, but yeah, you know, the kids remember. And I always tell you guys, we're here for kids. Mm -hmm. Understand. It's gonna be a really nice event. I get the safety issue. I get it. And let's not. Yeah, I don't want to make a mountain out of a model, right. but. And I understand but you have to make sure it's secure. Yeah. Right. So we can. Because you know, even though when schools in session, you know that is being supervised, mm -hmm. but. You know, when we're not here in holiday break, you know, Thanksgiving and stuff, you know, there's not much control over who's going to be around it. So, especially if an open hole has to be there for and until we can get a delivery. But I'd say, as far as an open hole, it'd be only open for overnight okay. or something like that. It's not like you're going to dig it and leave it open for you weeks and weeks because, you know, we don't have the time to play with it. No, and hopefully we can have a. Yep. Okay, so let's, let's do that. If you can reach out. 
um, to someone and make contact, and then um, Roger can possibly reach out yeah. to people okay. as well. Thank you. Get a couple opinions, and then and if everybody... If the force comes to worse, we'll take all those lights, and we'll decorate the outside of the school. No, I, <laughs> right. well, I mean, I guess it gets back to the whole point of this, is is what actually, what was the plan? I mean, we, we got here tonight, and we're like, we're going to put a tree in the ground. But they all have the lights and stuff based on something. I mean, there must have been a lot of planning ahead of this whole thing. And this must be option B because that option A was at the town. So, right. you know what I mean? So like, that was the plan. So the original plan right. was to bring the tree and, um, you know, I had to talk with some town people and said, okay. And then, I, so the, we, the body, student body went ahead, bought the lights, did everything, getting ready. Um, so. So you talked to the town board and the town board said okay? Well, it was presented um, to the town board right. last night, um, but the same type of discussion took yeah. place. And then it became, you know, okay, now it's becoming a liability. How safe can we guarantee that that tree is going to be as a town right. that mm -hmm. it's not going to fall over on, <coughs> you know, anyone? Um, so that's when the town had said, okay, you know, let's not do that big of a tree. We can do a much smaller tree or use the tree that is root bound that's there right now. Um, you know, yes, it's decorated with red, white, and blue, but that could come off or unplugged, you know, for the time being. But then I found out how big the bulbs the, the bulbs and the star are. So that's what brings us here. And, that, and this is plan B. So, so for these calculations, the only thing we're going to need to know the exact size of it, obviously, and then we'd have to have a range for the ones going forward. But you'd need the size of it, the base, things like that to make those calcs. So. Somebody's going to have to give us that information to be able to deal with that tomorrow. Okay. And, and how just, small of a tree do you think like you, say, you can get away with without the rather than light bulbs off, looking ridiculous? Close to the bottom, cut some more on the yeah, bottom. 20 feet. Lower 20? Down. Okay. So it sounds like a 20 so foot is I mean, minimum. They, they, they're they're Kel Tracy Kellogg has on her lights. Tracy's mm -hmm. donating. So John, okay. I'll ask John, and John can get all that information out. Okay. I'll ask him first thing in the morning. Okay. We'll just go, go see Tracy's. Say, which one is it? Okay, so we'll wait to hear from you and see what you find out. Okay. Yes. Uh, hi. hi. Um, from a student perspective, how will students be involved? It seems like I know like student groups donated money to have this put in place and buy the lights and everything, but how are we going to be able to decorate it? Because it seems like you have to have an adult with a lift, big lights, and the star on, but like. The students, especially student council, would love to be involved in decorating and making this uh, a Walton Central School tree. And what I, the way I understand how the students may be involved is the adults will do the top of the tree and the students will do the bottom of the tree. <laughs> you know, kind of like, and there's 12 because you can't go up on the lift, but you're right. And, it, and there's 1,200 bulbs that have to be actually screwed in to the light, so it's going to take some time for kids to do. This all true? Yeah. And then the kids will be involved with um, well, our plans, the plans that you have with the chorus and the band, right? Yeah, how we do we uh, well, we've got uh, yeah. Okay, so what we met when we met today. We talked about uh, after the the elementary school concert, which is a perfect kickoff because this way we're getting all the schools involved. Uh, the select chorus from Townsend Middle School High School chorus, we met just a couple of carols, uh, student council, and other groups putting together free hot chocolate. Miss Guptill's class cooking uh, the cookies uh, to give out, and then uh, and basically, and then turning the tree on, having it be an event that pulls all three schools in, uh, and it does and does exactly what we've all been trying to do is make the school the center of the community. Mm -hmm. so that would be nice. And it seems like sometimes a lot of these things, we're, and we brought this up specifically, the towns and schools sometimes uh, it's always about high school, middle school, and mm -hmm. something like this is it's fun to have all three schools involved. Plus, the fact you're going to have so many parents and grandparents already here for the concert because right. they all want to go to the elementary concert. So yeah, right. it's kind of a perfect storm. And Romy, if you think of anything else, talk to Mr. Knuski. They can help out. <laughs> Come see me tomorrow. But you're right. It, it would be limited to the actual decorating of it because of the height and the requirements that we would have to abide by, not allowing students up on the what do you call it? The lift, scissor lift, or something like that. So, thanks. Okay, so we will we'll leave it like that and wait to hear from you. And you'll get a hold of Roger, and then 
can yeah. contact us. We'll just, yeah. The bucket truck is joking that the kids holding on the bottom of the wire when they're right. going, when somebody's going yeah. out. So kids are going to be involved just as much as they do. They just won't be able to get on the bucket truck. They won't right. be able to get on the bucket truck. But somebody's got uh, an adult up in the bucket truck, and they're moving it around, going around with it's got to be, and the kids are going to have to bring the lines. And then once you get down so far, they just take it around and around. I mean, the kids will be involved just as much as they, they want to be. You're not taking that much wire up the yeah. truck and try to keep it untangled. Right. <laughs> no, but that's why the, I say the long-term goal would be to find a permanent location to make right. you know, and then Buy go tree. from there. Yeah. 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 You know, especially to try to keep the the cost or the donations or the fact that you're mm -hmm. just cutting and you know, because I'm sure there's going to be cleanup after you take the truck or the tree down. You know, that's going to be a lot of work. And the, you know, well, that's another thing. How long do you plan on leaving the tree up? So it was still after break, and then they would take it down. Okay. So you could be temperatures, snow. <laughs> take it down would be easy. <laughs> you got to save the lights. Yeah, I think I got to save the lights. <laughs> Let's hope it's not, not before a nice storm. Yeah. <laughs> all right. You have anything else? That is all I have. <laughs> I have discussed Christmas tree. <laughs> 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 I did, but I don't. Oh, wait. I, actually, I do have one. Yeah. Yeah. These are, and you guys can look at these. Are, these are just the, uh, you requested the course, oh, yes. courses yeah. for each uh, school. Uh, we didn't, and I talked with Rhonda, we went over this. We didn't put the numbers in, like, Townsend or the middle school. We just put the electives. You do have the course numbers um, with the enrollment uh, for the high school. Um, and you will see some of the enrollment, and you'll see the lower enrollments at our college level courses. Our AP courses, online courses. So okay, good. That's it. Okay, so um, with that being all, we have um, we need an executive session. Yes. Is that correct? Um, what was the for the arbitration? So I would say pending litigation. Yep, um, pending litigation. Okay, so do I have a motion for an executive Hold session? It. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Students, don't forget to get.